The man known to history as Ivan the Terrible, or Tsar Ivan IV of Russia, was born on the 25th of August 1530 in the Muscovite royal estate of Kolomenskoye, several kilometers outside of Moscow. His father was Vasily III, who had been Grand Prince of the Duchy or Principality of Muscovy and Sovereign of all Russia since his accession to the throne in 1505. Ivan's mother was Elena Glunskaya, a young noblewoman who was of mixed Serbian and other Slavic heritage. She had married Vasily as his second wife in 1526 after he had divorced his first wife, Salomonia, on account of the marriage not resulting in children. Elena was not an entirely popular choice as the new Grand Princess, as she had been raised as a Roman Catholic rather than as an Eastern Orthodox Christian. But the new union soon resulted in children to secure the succession. In addition to Ivan, another boy named Yuri was born in 1532. Although he was deaf and largely shunned by the political establishment who deemed him unfit for a position of authority due to his inability to hear. Ivan was the clear favorite to succeed his father following his birth in the autumn of 1530. Any assessment of Ivan's life has to consider it within the context of the profound changes which were occurring in Eastern Europe in the late 15th century and early 16th century. In the 15th century, there was no Russian state to speak of. Indeed, the term Rus had a peculiar medieval heritage. The word was derived from the old Finnish word for Swede, Rusviori, which the Arabs of the Muslim Caliphate in medieval times used as a term to refer to the Vikings who traveled down the great rivers of Eastern Europe, such as the Volga and the Dnieper from the 9th century onwards. These same Rus had established a number of trading city-states, duchies and republics across the region. These cities developed into significant regional powers in what are now European Russia and Ukraine between the 9th and 13th centuries, notably Kiev in Ukraine and the city-states of Novgorod, Muscovy and Skov in European Russia. During the 12th and 13th centuries, Novgorod was the most powerful of these, but its strength was significantly eroded in the 14th century as the Mongol hordes of Genghis Khan and his successors conquered lands from China to Eastern Europe. Following the Mongol invasion, splinter states began developing, such as the Crimean Horde and the Golden Horde, as well as the Khanate of Kazan in the region of Eastern Europe in the 14th and 15th centuries. By comparison with these other states, the Duchy of Muscovy was a very small kingdom when Ivan's grandfather, Ivan III, became its ruler as regent for his blind father in 1462. Though coming from a small state, Ivan, who is often referred to as Ivan the Great, began a process of expanding beyond the city of Moscow and the surrounding hinterland for a couple of hundred miles in each direction, making Muscovy an upstart regional power. During this period of expansion, he engaged in a prolonged war with Novgorod early in his reign, where he conquered Muscovy's great rival amongst the Eastern Orthodox Christian states of Russia by the mid-1470s. Conquest did not prevent revolts that continued in the former Novgorod territories for many years. Ivan III also subdued other Russian rival powers, such as Tver and Skov. Having either conquered these regions to the west of Muscovy or reduced them to the status of vassals, Ivan began an aggressive campaign against the Kazan Khanate, bringing Muscovite power further down the river Volga. His son, Ivan the Terrible's father, continued this process of expanding Muscovite influence. As Ivan came of age in the 1530s and 1540s, Muscovy was well on its way to becoming a dominant regional power in what is now the European part of Russia, west of the Ural Mountains. 
However, the Crimean Tatars and the Khanate of Astrakhan still controlled the lower reaches of the Volga River and the regions north of the Black Sea. This kept the Muscovite kings from having complete regional power when Ivan became ruler of the country in the mid-16th century. Ivan's rule commenced far earlier than many had expected. Though his father Vasily was still a relatively middle-aged man by the standards of the time and place, when Ivan was born in 1530, he was developing a huge abscess in his right hip during the early 1530s. While out hunting in mid-November 1533, he began having chronic pain and began bleeding incessantly from the abscess. Despite being treated by several doctors in the days that followed, the bleeding could not be stopped. Vasily was transported back to Moscow, where he survived for more than a week, being invested as a monk as his last request before he died on the 3rd of December 1533, probably from septicemia or blood poisoning rather than from blood loss. While Ivan should have succeeded smoothly thereafter, his youth and the unpopularity of his mother, who would act as regent during his infant and childhood years, were problems. And so, several other claimants emerged as potential rivals to Ivan's succession. These included Prince Andrei Staritsky and Prince Yuri Ivanovich, two of Vasily's younger brothers. Ultimately, the Muscovite nobility and Orthodox Church establishment relented and agreed to Ivan's succession on the strength of his father's deathbed declaration that Ivan, regardless of his age, should succeed him. It would be many years before Ivan was in any position to start playing an active role in ruling Muscovy and Russia. In the interim, his mother performed the role of regent alongside a regency council of some of the leading nobles and church figures of the day. However, this dispensation only lasted until 1538, when Elena died at a very young age, most likely before her 30th year. It is now widely believed that she was poisoned as part of a clandestine coup orchestrated at the Muscovite court by the powerful Shusky faction. This would certainly fit with the moves made upon Elena's death by Prince Vasily Vasilievich of the Shusky family to seize power from other rivals, such as Prince Ivan Belsky. He then moved to release his cousin, Andrei Mikhailovich, from prison, where he had been incarcerated for some time, owing to suspicions about his loyalty to Elena's regency government. Vasily and Andrei served as the de facto rulers of Russia from 1538 to 1547, when Ivan finally began to reign in his own right. Meanwhile, during these years, Ivan was tutored by several prominent men of learning in what was a relatively novel decision to begin educating a Russian prince in the new humanist strains of learning and education which were arriving in Russia from Western and Central Europe in the 16th century. As a result, Ivan became a force for modernizing the Muscovite state. Ivan's minority came to an end in early 1547, when he was nearly 16 and a half years old. He was formally crowned as Grand Prince Ivan IV on the 16th of January 1547 at the Cathedral of the Dormition in the Kremlin in Moscow. This was a ceremony which blended different traditions inherited from the Eastern Orthodox Church, which Moscow had become the global center of following the fall of Constantinople to the Muslim Ottomans in 1453. While deeply influenced by Greek Orthodoxy, the ceremony also drew from Mongol and other Asiatic crowning ceremonies. Muscovy was a land blended between the West and East, its traditions showing influence of both. Though many teenage rulers throughout the globe and across time ascended to the throne only to be manipulated by advisors and family members for decades, Ivan made clear, even as a teenager, that he intended to rule in his own stead. 
While he did not shelve others entirely who had held power during his youth, he drastically reduced their influence over government affairs in the late 1540s. Thus, for instance, the power of the Shuskis was reduced, though some of the family's princes did remain powerful figures within the Muscovite army for over a decade. It was at this time that he assumed absolute control of the government and adopted the title of Tsar of all Russia. Some believe that Ivan was the first Muscovite ruler to adopt this title. In reality, his grandfather, Ivan III, had begun to use the title in some of his correspondence in the late 15th century, but Ivan IV was the first ruler to formally adopt it as his unequivocal title. The title Tsar is derived from the Slavic word Tsar, which is rooted in the Roman imperial title of Caesar. The rise of Caesar Augustus in the late 1st century BC onwards led to the practice of honoring the Roman general Julius Caesar, who had attempted to seize control of the Roman government. In assuming the title of Tsar, Ivan was, in 1547, drawing on a long history of Roman imperialism. Although the exact title's application would change on a number of occasions over the centuries, the rulers of Russia would continue to refer to themselves as Tsars until the Russian Revolution brought the empire to an end in 1917. In tandem, his court began adopting the trappings of imperial power. A visitor to Moscow in the 1560s, for instance, would have been ushered into an imperial court where Ivan was seated on a great throne, carved from ivory and walrus bone, with scenes depicting Old Testament stories and motifs from Russian mythology and history, while Ivan would have worn the Kazan crown on his head, a great imperial crown struck from gold and many priceless gemstones. Ivan's reign was hit by a crisis at almost exactly the same time that he began to rule in his own right. This crisis centered around the first of two major fires which struck Moscow during Ivan's reign. Enormous infernos which destroyed large parts of major cities were not uncommon during the early modern period and were, typically, fueled by the fact that wood was used much more widely in the construction of homes, with candles and fires used to provide light and heat in an age prior to electrification and home heating. In addition, firefighting services were virtually non-existent as a component of municipal life. In the case of the Great Fire of Moscow of 1547, it occurred on the 24th of June at the height of the summer. The inferno started near the city centre, but really turned into a disaster of epic proportions when it spread to the Kremlin district and entered the military arsenal there, leading to a huge explosion in the gunpowder store. In the hours that followed, the fire raged out of control, eventually spreading across Moscow and displacing upwards of 70,000 people, approximately half of the population. Over 2,500 people lost their lives in the disaster, which also led to increasing social unrest and an insurrection against Ivan's maternal family, the powerful Glinsky family, who were perceived as having been in charge of the government during Ivan's minority and so were condemned, unfairly, as being responsible for the fire and its brutal impact. One of the family, Yuri Glinsky, was stoned to death in the streets of Moscow in the aftermath of the fire. But eventually, Ivan's government managed to restore stability across the city. Moscow quickly recovered in the years that followed, but, as we will see, this was not the only major fire which impacted on the Russian capital during Ivan's reign. Ivan had a significantly stable personal and marital life during the late 1540s and throughout the 1550s, the period encompassing the first decade and a bit of his reign. Much of this was owing to his first marriage. This 
was entered into in 1547 when Ivan was still a teenager and right around the time that he was crowned as Grand Prince. At this time, he married a woman by the name of Anastasia Romanovna, a daughter of Yureyevich Zakarin Yureyev, a senior Muscovite noble who served as an Okanichi in Muscovy, a leading court official. As such, Anastasia's marriage to Ivan was political initially, but they were nearly exactly the same age, Anastasia perhaps being just a year older, although her date of birth is not concretely known. And the marriage was a happy one. They had many children, three daughters and three sons. Anna was born in 1548, not long after they wed, followed by Maria in 1551, Dmitri the next year, Ivan in 1554, Eudoxia in 1556, and finally Theodor in 1557. Four of the six, though, would die in infancy or childhood, and by the end of the 1550s, only Ivan and Theodor were still alive. Then, to compound this tragedy, Anastasia died as well in the autumn of 1560. She was only around 30 years of age, and rumours abounded afterwards that she may have been poisoned, though there seems to be no concrete evidence to support this supposition. More broadly, Anastasia's death led to a change in Ivan's behaviour in the 1560s. If there is a point at which his rule became more tyrannical, it was as her moderating influence on him was removed from 1560 onwards. The early years of Ivan's reign saw some significant domestic reforms implemented as he sought to modernize the Russian state. Much of this was achieved through the Sudebnik of 1550. This revised and expanded a previous law code which had been promulgated for Muscovy by Ivan III back in 1497. Yet, while the earlier Sudebnik had sought to ensure the rights and privileges of the aristocracy and church, this new law code was more concerned with strengthening emerging state institutions such as the court system and the embryonic Russian parliamentary and local government system, one which had evolved over the previous century as Muscovy had conquered and annexed regions like Skjov, Novgorod and Tver. Under the provisions of the new Sudebnik, local authorities would have a say in what suspects could be arrested on a wide range of different matters. In allowing this document to be produced so early after attaining his majority in 1547, Ivan was indicating that he intended to be a reforming monarch. Unfortunately, though, he would only remain committed to ideas such as this for the first half of his reign. There were numerous other reforms in various spheres of Russian life inaugurated by Ivan. A good example is the reforms implemented into the Russian Orthodox Church through the Council of the Hundred Chapters or the Stoglav Synod, which was convened in Moscow in 1551. This was overseen by Ivan and Makarius, the Metropolitan of the Russian Orthodox Church between 1542 and 1563 making him the effective head of the Russian church for over 20 years. At this synod, various aspects of religious ritual within the church which had emerged over the previous decades were debated on and resolved. In many ways, this was a series of incidents within the Russian Orthodox Church that mirrored some of the issues occurring in the schisms between Catholics and Protestants in Reformation Europe since the late 1510s, insofar as Orthodox Church figures were also debating the suitability of using extensive iconography within churches and whether or not this constituted idolatry, if done to excess, a key issue within the Protestant Reformation. There were also issues around reforming the conduct of Russian clergy and how mass and other rituals were performed. Thus, here in Russia in the early 1550s, Ivan was leading a movement to peaceably reform the Russian Orthodox Church 
before it led to the sort of schisms which ripped Western and Central Europe apart in the 16th century and created decades of violent religious wars. Ivan also left his imprint on the physical environment of Moscow in the 16th century, helping to turn the city from a provisional and backward city into the heart of a modern empire. Many of his improvements made by Ivan have since been destroyed during the Napoleonic Wars and during the Second World War. However, some of the buildings built have survived to the present. One of the most prominent of the surviving structures is St. Basil's Cathedral, an Orthodox church which was built on what is now Red Square as a commemorative building to memorialize Ivan's defeat of the Kazan Khanate to the southeast of Moscow early on in his reign. It is instantly recognizable with its numerous towers of swirling colors and is unique in terms of its architectural style, blending oriental elements with architectural forms derived from Eastern Orthodoxy and the earlier Byzantine Empire. The nine domes correspond to nine different churches and chapels and were intended to look like bonfires raging into the sky. Admittedly, elements of this had been initiated under Ivan's grandfather and father, but he furthered the work on it more than any other ruler of Russia, employing teams of Greek and Italian migrant architects and others to impose Renaissance styles on it also. Few buildings in Eastern Europe are as iconic of the region's history and culture and Ivan was broadly responsible for this. During the period, it was a project of grandiose design and an indication of the wealth and power of the Russian people. The 1550s were notable in terms of the growing manner in which Ivan's state was pulled into the wider diplomatic matrix of early modern Europe. In 1530, when Ivan was born, Few people had heard of Russia in Western and Central Europe as anything more than an exotic land to the east that almost nobody visited. It was backwards, isolated and unimportant to European affairs. This was best reflected by the level of trade between Muscovy and countries like England, France or Spain, which was almost non-existent. This was for a number of reasons. Firstly, the region which we now refer to as Russia had traditionally been divided into numerous smaller states such as Novgorod, Pskov and Muscovy. But perhaps more importantly, Muscovy, even after it became the dominant power in the region and indeed until the early 18th century, did not have access to a major Baltic seaport. Instead, the region around Karelia, in what is now the city of St. Petersburg, south towards the Baltic states, was controlled by the Kingdom of Sweden, the Kingdom of Denmark-Norway, and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth at various times. As such, there was no major maritime outlet through which Muscovy could engage in trade with the major states of Western or Central Europe, as trade in these days was overwhelmingly naval. The few ports available were locked in ice the majority of the year, thus preventing year-round trade. Furthermore, land trade with great European powers was nigh on impossible, in part because of the vast distance and the numerous minor states controlling the trade routes. Thus, Muscovy remained isolated in the 15th and early 16th century. This all changed following an initiative on the part of English colonial adventurers in the early 1550s. During the 1500s, Europe was inflamed with continental conflict between the various powers. Some of these battles stemmed from long-standing rivalries between royal families, such as the Habsburg and Bourbon families, led to massive conflicts and long-lasting wars. Religion also played a tremendous role in expanding international conflict. This, in large measure, came from the divides between Protestant and Catholic nations. In particular, England and Spain began to develop a deeper rivalry. 
England was a relative outlier in European politics prior to the 1500s. It was considered a minor kingdom and a backwater when compared with the Habsburg Holy Roman Empire and Spanish Empire. English monarchs were anxious to expand their power and integrate them more fully into European politics. One manner in which England sought to narrow that gap was by expanding its overseas trade and territorial expansion. Some of their earliest efforts came soon after the Italian explorer Christopher Columbus discovered the Americas for Spain by landing in the Caribbean in 1492. It was actually John Cabot, another Italian in the employ of King Henry VII of England, who first landed on the mainland of North America in 1497, not the Spanish. English explorers continued to seek out new naval routes in the decades that followed. In particular, they were interested to discover either a northwest or northeast passage via the Americas or Asia to the Pacific Ocean in order to access Asian, particularly Chinese, markets. During the early 1550s, English explorers like Stephen Burroughs and Hugh Willoughby sought to find the Northeast Passage by sailing north of Russia. They would never achieve their goal, and indeed, it would take until the 19th century before this endeavor became possible. But they did manage to make contact with the state of Muscovy by sailing north of Scandinavia and landing in the White Sea near the port of Archangelsk. By 1555, the Muscovy Company was founded in London as the first joint stock company ever created and over the course of the second half of the 1550s, a steady trade developed between Russia and England. Ivan's government sent furs and other items north to Archangelsk to be shipped to Western Europe while the English sent Western European goods and knowledge about developing Renaissance scientific and cultural pursuits to Russia, Muscovy's isolation was over. The arrival of the English and the establishment of trading links between the two nations in the 1550s was just one aspect of the infiltration of European society into Muscovy during Ivan's reign. One other notable aspect of this was the extension of the printing revolution to Russia. The first movable type printing presses had been invented in Europe in the border regions between France and Germany back in the mid-15th century, and they had spread in the decades that followed to major cities like Paris, Venice, Antwerp, and London. However, in some instances, it took until well into the 16th century before cities like Dublin in Ireland or some parts of the Balkans to have an established press. Moscow was a major outlier. It was not until the Moscow Print Yard was established in 1553, largely under Ivan's direction, that the first major domestic print industry began to emerge in Russia. As with the press in most other countries, the first works which were produced and published through the Moscow Print Yard were religious texts such as A Book of Hours and Psalter. Yet, as elsewhere in Europe too, the Russian printing presses soon came under enormous levels of government censorship, and this was particularly acute by the 1570s as Ivan's reign became more and more autocratic. Ivan's reign was one of the most important in the early emergence of the Russian state, insofar as he followed through on the work which was initiated most notably by his grandfather in the late 15th century. His primary goal was to complete the conquest of the Mongol Tatars and states which continued to hold a large amount of lands further down the course of the River Volga towards the northern shores of the Caspian Sea and also further to the west on the northern shores of the Black Sea all lands that had access to warm water or ice-free ports. Again, this was work which Ivan III had commenced decades earlier, but Ivan IV would bring it to its conclusion in the 1550s and 1560s. One of the methods which he used 
was to ally Russia with the Cossacks of the Pontic Caspian steppe east near the Ural Mountains. These were a cavalry aristocracy which had ruled over much of this region for centuries and had retained semi-autonomy even as the Mongols had established the Golden Horde and the Crimean Khanate in the 14th century. Now, Ifan cultivated them as allies. With them, he managed to quickly conquer the Kazan Khanate to the southeast of Moscow, securing the city and northwestern Russia in general against raids. With this done, Ivan quickly moved in the mid-1550s to strike against some of the Mongol successor states to the south of his empire. These include the Nogai Horde, a regional power based along the eastern edges of the Caspian Sea in what is now Kazakhstan, but which also had lands further to the north. Between 1554 and 1556, Ivan's armies campaigned southwards to the Caspian against the Nogai Horde and the Astrakhan Khanate. In 1556, Astrakhan at the mouth of the river Volga and occupying the entry of the river into the Caspian Sea was finally seized by the Russians, adding one of the most strategic cities in the entire region to the Russian Empire and also a major economic hub. It was from this date onwards that Russia began to become synonymous with the production of caviar, as it was here in the lower reaches of the Caspian Sea that the sturgeon, which produced caviar, were caught in such abundance. A new Russian fortress was constructed here to act as a major stronghold for Russian rule at the gateway to the Caucasus. Thus, by the end of the 1560s, Ivan had extended the Russian state southwards to the Caspian Sea and was transforming the region as well from a Muslim geopolitical region to a Russian Orthodox center. The wars of expansion continued into the 1560s. Most notable of all of them was the first Russo-Turkish War, which occurred between 1568 and 1570. In entering into this war, Ivan was bringing Russia into its first direct clash with the Ottoman Empire, a power which Russia would end up regularly in conflict with for the next three and a half centuries down to the end of the First World War. The Ottomans initiated this first war in the hopes of pushing the Russians out of the lower river Volga and the Astrakhan region after they had seized it in the mid-1550s. It was a disaster for the Ottomans. They were repulsed from the Astrakhan region and then their armies encountered such poor weather on the retreat back towards the Caucasus and Turkey that thousands of soldiers froze to death. Their fleet in the region was also badly impaired. At this time, the Ottoman Empire was one of the most powerful and influential players in European affairs. Ivan's success was one of the few major Christian victories of the period. As time went by, the clashes between the Ottoman Empire and the Russian Empire would come to focus more on the Black Sea and eventually the Balkans as Russia attempted to expand its influence into regions like Moldova and Romania. But that was a task for a generation very distant from Ivan's. There was one final theater of conflict for the Russians during Ivan's reign. This was with the Crimean Tatars or Crimean Khanate, yet another of the Mongol successor states which had emerged in the 14th and 15th centuries to dominate much of the north shores of the Black Sea and Ukraine. In the early 1570s, after the Russo-Turkish War wound down in Astrakhan, the Crimean leader, Khan Devlet I Jirei, began launching aggressive raids up the river Dnieper and other waterways in the Donetsk and Donbass regions towards Moscow. As they did, Ivan and the Russians were forced to begin launching counterattacks. However, there would be no decisive result here during Ivan's reign. But one of the foremost military concerns of the Russian state over the next two centuries 
was to conquer the Crimean region and obtain a Black Sea port which would act as a conduit for greater Russian expansion in the Caucasus and northeastern Balkans. While these processes would be slow and gradual, taking until the late 18th century to largely bear fruit, it is very significant that these geopolitical objectives were first developed during Ivan's reign. In many ways, the consequences of them are still being felt in the early 21st century. The wars with the Tatars of Crimea and Astrakhan, as well as the Turks, while generally successful for Ivan, did have the unwanted impact of leading to the second major destruction of Moscow during his reign. The city had been rebuilt and re-emerged as a major urban centre following the devastating fire of 1547, but in 1571 it was devastated again. This time, it was not owing to an accidental urban fire. Instead, in the spring of 1571, a large army of upwards of 40,000 Turks, Tatars and Janissaries the latter being an elite force of slave soldiers who fought under the Ottoman sultans in early modern times, advanced up the course of the River Volga and struck at Moscow itself. Bypassing the defensive fortifications which the Muscovites had established along the middle course of the river and to the south of the city decades earlier, an army, led by the Crimean Tatar general Devlet Jireh, attacked Moscow on the 24th of May, 1571. The attack on the capital was brief, but it resulted in a devastating blow to the city as fires were started in the suburbs and quickly spread as unfavorable winds blew it towards the city center. While the Turks and Tatars soon withdrew, the fire unleashed enormous damage. Historians disagree widely on the exact number of casualties, but most place it in the region of tens of thousands of deaths, while the city was devastated in a manner which would not be seen again until 1812 when Napoleon Bonaparte's armies seized Moscow and the Russians set the city alight to prevent it falling into French hands. Consequently, the city which Ivan had inherited in the 1530s was a much different one to that which was there when his reign ended for the simple reason that Moscow was devastated twice by major fires during his reign in 1547 and 1571 and had to be rebuilt on two occasions. One of the least noted elements of Ivan's reign, but one which has shaped the modern world to a greater extent, was the expansion of the Russian state over the Ural Mountains and into what we now broadly term Siberia. Though today Russia extends its control from Europe to the Pacific Ocean and across 11 time zones, when Ivan ascended to the throne as first Tsar of Russia, Muscovy and Russia was just a small state centered on the city of Moscow, with some holdings to the south along the River Volga. Certainly, there were already some intrepid explorers who had begun to voyage eastwards towards the Ural Mountains and the cold, frozen tundra of northern Russia and Siberia, but little by way of concerted colonization of this region had been engaged in. It was during the latter years of Ivan's reign that this process was commenced in a concerted fashion and the gradual expansion of the Russian state into the world's largest geographical country began. The first major expansion eastward took place in 1580 when a small force of just over 500 Cossacks or mounted Russian and Slavic warriors from the Pontic Caspian steppe voyaged eastwards over the Ural Mountains, which lie in a great line from the northern shores of the Caspian Sea all the way north to the Arctic Circle. This expedition was led by Yermak Timofeyevich and aimed to conquer the Sibir Khanate, which lies today north of Kazakhstan. Here, they faced native opposition from various Ugric peoples, but also 
from the Tatars, who were the descendants of the Mongols and still held sway over most of Central Asia and Transoxiana. Clashes occurred between Timofeyevich's forces and those of the Kuchum in 1581 and 1582, and eventually led to Timofeyevich establishing Russian control over this region centered on the settlement of Kashlik. Although Timofeyevich would die in 1585, not long after Ifan himself, the settlement of Tobolsk was founded in the Sibir region east of the Urals in 1587, and so the continued eastward drive was undertaken from Ivan's reign onwards. By the middle of the 17th century, Russians would reach Kamchatka in the far east of Asia and eventually would even extend their colonization efforts across the Bering Straits to Alaska. Ivan's reign was immensely important in this process. Much of Ivan's increasingly unstable rule and behavior in the 1560s and 1570s was connected with his personal and marital life. He married many more times after his first wife, Anastasia, died in 1560, and far from being the genial influence on him that his first wife had been, many of his subsequent spouses are believed to have acted to cultivate his more neurotic behavior. The most damaging in this respect was his second wife, Maria Temrukovna, a noblewoman from the south of Muscovy's territories towards the Caspian Sea, who may have been a pagan in her early life. She is generally assessed as having had a negative impact on Ivan during their marriage between 1561 and 1569, and played a role in the establishment of the Oprichnina, the first secret police of a kind ever created in Russia, setting a dangerous precedent which has continued for nearly half a millennium thereafter. Despite rumors that he also poisoned her when she died in 1569, there is no evidence to support this. Thereafter, Ivan entered into a series of whirlwind marriages in the 1570s. He was in a union of just over two weeks with his third wife, Martha, in the early winter of 1571, before she died under mysterious circumstances. A fourth wife, Anna, wed in 1572, ended up being sent to a monastery in 1574 after the marriage failed to result in any children. Further short-lived relationships followed in the second half of the 1570s, but by then the leaders of the Orthodox Church in Russia were refusing to give their religious blessing to any further marriages, and so historians today debate whether Ivan can theoretically be said to have married only four times or as many as eight times, with some of his later partners often described as concubines rather than wives. In any event, these latter marriages were nowhere near as important as his first two, but they do serve to highlight his increasingly unstable and erratic conduct in the 1570s. In the course of these myriad marriages and marriage proposals, one of the more intriguing developments was the proposal for Ifan to marry Queen Elizabeth I of England. Elizabeth famously remained unmarried throughout her long reign and became known as the Virgin Queen, a point still heavily debated by historians and pop culturists. She certainly had numerous suitors for her hand in marriage, which included everyone from a domestic lord, Robert Dudley, 1st Earl of Leicester, to several members of the French royal family in the 1570s as England sought an alliance with the French against Spain. It has been a matter of debate as to whether Ifan proposed that he would marry Elizabeth as well in the early 1580s, at a time when Elizabeth was already beyond her childbearing years and talks of her marrying were beginning to wind down. There are no documents extant in either British or Russian archives today which clearly indicate that Ivan wanted to marry the English Queen, but recent research has argued that an informal proposal, one which was not written down, 
but which was conveyed by the mercantile diplomats who were moving between Russia and England by the early 1580s was in fact made. In any event, it was rebutted, but it is intriguing that this autocratic ruler, whose marital life was so similar to that of Elizabeth's father, King Henry VIII, ever proposed such a union to begin with. By the standards of the time, English politicians in London would largely have viewed the offer as coming from a semi-barbarian Asiatic ruler, and it must have been received with some peculiar responses in England. Ivan was a man of contrasts. We have only one genuine physical depiction of him, a portrait embossed on the cover of the first printed apostle of 1564, but the portrait is very crude and gives little away about his appearance. Other portraits made in the decades after his death, based on physical descriptions provided by those who had known Ivan, suggest that he was of a rather Asiatic bone structure, with his face appearing almost more Mongolian than that of a modern Russian, a not unexpected development given the dominance of the Crimean and Kazan Tatars across much of the region in the late medieval period. He had wide, large eyes, an energetic visage according to these portraits, and sported a substantial beard, as was the fashion across much of early modern Europe and in Russia in particular. Scientific analysis of his remains in recent times indicate he was a relatively large man who weighed close to 200 pounds, but athletically built and standing close to six foot in his prime, making him taller than usual by 16th century standards. He was a cultured man, of that there is little doubt, given that he is known to have written poetry and religious hymns, while also acting as a keen sponsor of the wider arts in Russia. Early on in his life, he was a more balanced and rational individual, though certainly never a pacifist or someone who flinched from violence or confrontation. That all began to change in the course of the 1560s, and in particular, in the 1570s. Ivan was about to earn his nickname of Ivan the Terrible. Various factors influenced Ivan to become a far more brutal ruler from 1560 onwards. The most profound was surely the death of his first, much-loved wife, Anastasia, and the lingering concern that she might have been poisoned. Another was the sheer Machiavellian nature of the Russian court, where factions conspired to gain power over others and brutally crushed their enemies when possible. All of this, combined with the fraught manner in which he had been raised as a puppet ruler at the behest of others, left Ivan a damaged individual even before Anastasia died. But when she left, he became unhinged. He began to see conspiracies and factions developing where they occasionally existed, but not always in the way he imagined. By the mid-1560s, he was actively running the government in a way which was designed to crush the power of all other factional groups beyond his sole rule. Whether they were senior figures within the Orthodox Church, the most respected nobles and magistrates or mighty courtiers. In all of this, he was highly manipulative. For instance, shortly after Anastasia's death in 1560, he withdrew to the town of Alexandrov, over 120 kilometers from Moscow. From there, he wrote to the ministers in Moscow that he intended to abdicate, but this was nothing more than a ruse for him to be able to call for wider-ranging powers to attack anyone he suspected of treason and to take their lands under crown ownership. Russian nobles and citizens did have rights in the early modern period, as elsewhere in Europe, as enshrined through documents like England's Magna Carta. What Ivan was aiming to do through these new measures was to completely undermine those rights and to set up a new system based around a highly autocratic ruler. His actions deeply impacted the relationship between the Tsars and the people for the next several generations.
There is no doubt that the most brutal element of this campaign of state terror which Ivan waged in the 1560s and 1570s was through the creation of the Aprichnina. This was conceived initially as a kind of household bodyguard for the Tsar and the royal family, based on Ivan's growing paranoia about poisonings at the royal court, but it soon expanded to become a quasi-secret police, one with judicial powers as well, which allowed it to operate as a court. Between 1565 and 1572, Ivan used it to extensively persecute and attack the Russian aristocracy. Much of this was in the form of extortionate taxes to pay for new military fortifications and the operations of the Oprichnina itself, which at its height involved nearly a thousand personnel, many of them being commoners brought in to attack the privileges and rights of the nobility. Some victims were also tried and even executed, while others were imprisoned. The worst incidents involved mass arrests of thousands of the minor nobility and aristocratic lineages, with some being made to march across large distances in Russia during the cold winter with little by way of provisions or suitable clothing. Even these, though, paled by comparison with the massacre of Novgorod, an episode in the early weeks of 1570 when an initial concern about alleged treason amongst church officials in the city of Novgorod spiralled into pogroms which left thousands dead by mid-February. By that time, an air of desperation, suspicion and fear had gripped Russia as Ivan's terror reign grew worse and worse. The culmination of all of Ivan's paranoia and brutality was one of the most infamous events of early Tsarist Russia when Ivan allegedly killed his only son and namesake. Ivan Ivanovich was one of Ivan's sons from his first marriage. He was born to Anastasia in 1554 and was the designated heir to his father as the eldest surviving son his older brother Dmitri having died in infancy in the summer of 1553. However, during the 1570s, Tsar Ivan's relationship with his son had deteriorated, perhaps, as historians have speculated, owing to disagreements between the pair over the Russian prosecution of a war with Poland, Lithuania and Sweden at the time, or perhaps because Ivan simply disagreed with many of the ways in which his son was choosing to live his life. Whatever the cause, we know the result. On the 19th of November, 1581, the father and son became embroiled in an argument, during which Ivan is alleged to have struck his son so firmly over the head that he slumped to the ground unconscious and bleeding from his temple. In the moments which followed, Ivan seems to have suddenly come to his senses and expressed remorse for his actions, but that did not stop Ivan from dying there and then from the head wound in a scene famously depicted by the 19th century Russian painter Ilya Repin. It was a gruesome footnote to the reign of terror Ivan had unleashed in the second half of his time as Tsar of Russia. The final major acts of Ivan's reign centered to a large extent on his efforts to expand the Russian state westward towards the Baltic Sea. Although it is firmly associated with this waterway today, for centuries the Muscovites and Russians did not have access to the Baltic Sea and the region from Karelia in Finland south through what is now St. Petersburg and towards the Kaliningrad Oblast on the Baltic Sea was ruled by powers such as Sweden and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Ivan was the first ruler to make a concerted effort to seize some of this territory in an effort to acquire a warmer Baltic Sea port. To this end, in 1558, he had launched the Livonian War, so named after the region of Livonia around what is now Latvia. The war was initially a relatively limited affair, and in the course of the late 1550s and into the 1560s, 
If Anne and his generals were more determined to seize lands off the Tatars and Turks to the south than with the stop-start Livonian War. Yet, peace terms were never agreed, and by the 1570s, as Ivan was emerging victorious in his clashes with Astrakhan and the Turks, he was able to turn his attentions more completely towards the Poles and Lithuanians. His greatest success during these years was in conquering the city of Narva on the Baltic Sea coast. The city had been controlled by Sweden, which had entered the war on the side of the Poles and Lithuanians, alongside the Danes and Norwegians. Ivan's enemies to the west became far stronger in 1569, when the Union of Lublin resulted in the formal amalgamation of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Kingdom of Poland into the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. This, combined with the emergence of Stephen Bathory, the former Grand Duke of Lithuania, as a major military commander in charge of the Polish ranks, changed the military stalemate, and by the late 1570s, Russia was losing ground to the Commonwealth. In 1579, Polotsk was occupied by a Polish-Lithuanian force, while in 1581, Bathory laid siege to the city of Skoff, well inside Russian territory. Around the same time, the Swedes retook Narva, the major gain which Ivan had made during the war. Thereafter, matters began to wind down as Ivan realized that his ambitions to conquer Livonia and gain access to the Baltic Sea would remain unfulfilled. While a determined expansionist, Ivan was unwilling to throw his kingdom away for a failing war. Peace terms were negotiated, with Sweden emerging as the major victor in the conflict, acquiring control over most of Livonia from Denmark, which had been forced to relinquish control over much of the region owing to domestic problems. The Livonian War was the one element of Ivan's foreign policy which ended with a considerable failure to achieve his goals and expand the Russian state. Ivan died at the end of what had been a very long reign of over 50 years, but still at a comparatively young age in the spring of 1584, at just 53 years of age. There was seemingly no prolonged illness or precursor to his demise, but rather he died of what is widely understood to have been a stroke on the 28th of March 1584. Legend has it that he was playing chess with Bogdan Belsky, one of his closest allies in government during the latter stages of his reign, and a figure involved in the Livonian Wars and efforts to expand Russia towards the Baltic Sea. The event was famously commemorated in a painting by Ivan Bilibin in 1935. How romanticized the idea of him having died playing chess is a matter of some historical dispute. Ivan was subsequently buried in the Cathedral of the Archangel in Moscow. In 1963, his remains were exhumed and scientific studies were carried out by Soviet scientists. These concluded that Ivan had not met his end owing to any form of poisoning, something which there had been a lingering suspicion of for many centuries, but that he had developed a major musculoskeletal disorder in his later years, which quite probably left him largely immobilized during the late 1570s and early 1580s, down to his death. It has been suggested that this might have been connected as well to a temporal lobe disorder, and that this could plausibly have been partially responsible for his increasingly unstable and violent conduct during the second half of his reign. This temporal lobe condition might also explain his alleged death from a stroke, which might have actually been an epileptic attack of a kind which he was increasingly prone to in his later years. As such, Ifan the Terrible might have become so terrible because of a major medical malady which was simply beyond the scientific grasp of individuals in 16th century Europe. The evidence remains inconclusive, leaving the matter unsettled and unclear.
Ivan's death led to the breakdown of Russian political stability, which his reign, for all his failings, had done much to foster and uphold, at least in the first 15 years or so of his personal rule. The decades after his passing became known as the Time of Troubles. This period lasted from the inception of the reign of his son and successor, Theodore I in 1584, down to 1613. Theodore was an introspective, quiet individual who had little interest in governing in the activist manner which his father had. Accordingly, he handed over much of the day-to-day -day management of government affairs to Boris Godunov, his brother-in-law through his marriage to Irina Godunov. The all but regency government of Godunov created problems in and of itself, as the perception emerged that Theodore was a puppet czar, but matters became even more unstable when he died in 1598 without a legitimate heir. This brought the Rurik dynasty, which had ruled Muscovy and then Russia for centuries, to an end. In the en passe, Russia's enemies were able to capitalize on the political instability which followed, with the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth invading some of Russia's territories and occupying them for a time in the early 17th century. Meanwhile, the title of Tsar changed hands between half a dozen different claimants within Russia in the 15 years between 1598 and 1613. It was only when one of these challenges, Mikhail Romanov, managed to establish himself as the Tsar of all Russia that the time of troubles came to an end, and Russia recommenced its emergence as one of the great powers of modern Europe, building on the initial imperial vision of Ivan IV, who believed Muscovy to be capable of far more than it had previously been. Ivan's family envisioned an empire, and the Romanovs fulfilled it. Ivan IV was one of the most paradoxical rulers of early modern European history. He is known as the Terrible to history, not exactly a descriptor that any individual aims to have applied to them as a ruler, but it is in many ways an unfair description, or at least one which only describes a certain portion of his reign. In reality, Ivan was a strong ruler, one who inherited an expanding Russian state and did much to continue that process by conquering new lands down the course of the River Volga and to the north of the Black Sea. It was also in the latter stages of his reign that Russia began the process of colonizing the vast portions of Asian Russia to the east of the Ural Mountains. In this respect, he must be viewed as one of the country's most consequential rulers. But there was another side to him. Ivan became an increasingly repressive and autocratic figure in the second half of his reign, particularly so after the death of his first wife, a balancing influence on him whose removal from the scene led to the accentuation of his worst tendencies combined with a possible deteriorating mental illness. In the years that followed, he began developing the Oprichnina as an instrument of state terror in Russia. This was a hugely significant development, and this secret police established a long tradition within Russia of state terror, one which has a direct line down to Stalinism and the KGB in the 20th century. Ivan was a man who seized the moment and reigned in a way that impacted the future of Russia down to the present. What do you think of Ivan the Terrible? Should he be known as the Terrible? Or is this an unfair title given his pivotal role in setting Muscovy on the path to becoming the Russian Empire? Please let us know in the comment section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.